So um, good afternoon. We'll go ahead and get started. And as people are joining, um, uh, we'll, we'll see you when you're here. So uh, welcome to today's webinar on the skillful application of manure-based compost. This session is a collaboration by Future Harvest, Chesapeake Harvest, and the Million Acre Challenge. Um, Future Harvest focuses on farmer-to-farmer -farmer education predominantly um, in the Chesapeake region. Chesapeake Harvest is our resident food safety experts in the area. And uh, the Million Acre Challenge is a new uh, Maryland-based uh, soil health initiative. And um, all coming together for the topic of uh, looking at skillful use of manure-based compost. So my name is Neve Short. I'm the field school director at Future Harvest. And I'll be the moderator for today's presentation. Um, so bear with us as we're shifting from one presenter to the next. We have uh, a lot of really great panelists joining today. Um, so thank you all for coming to share your expertise and time. And we couldn't have planned it better with a rainy day. So yay or snowy day. Uh, that works out really nicely. Um, so I'll just briefly mention our panelists and, and who's joining. and. Um, when we're thinking about using manure-based compost, there are so many different components to take into consideration. There's the actual farming, you know, fitting into your farming system and making sure you have the right equipment and the timing of when to apply it. Then with food safety concerns, you know, how are you making sure pathogens aren't being spread across your farm operation, especially if you're growing uh, food for human consumption. We have nutrient management uh, considerations with you know, phosphorus levels being high in certain regions, um, soil health considerations, and, uh, and then of course the compost itself. How do you know if it's good compost and how to identify that? So we have a panel of um, really great people who can bring uh, information on each of these components. And um, We'll go ahead and start with Hanna, who is our uh, farmer expert on the panel. So Hanna Newcomb is with Potomac Vegetable Farm and she'll share a little bit about her operation and um, how compost fits into it and decisions that are made that way. So thank you, Hanna, for, for joining. Thank you. And thanks everybody for even wanting to talk about compost because it's kind of one of the most important things you can think about when you're talking about growing food at all. and um, our farm is in the Washington, D.C. area, so all of our food is sold on a retail basis to people within an hour of Washington, D.C., I would say. So it's a pretty high dollar area um, with kind of some high expectations about value and and the kind of thing we're going to sell. So we're, we, have to be, we have to be careful about doing everything to the standard that we say we're gonna do it to. And one of those things is taking really good care of our soil. Um, I'm gonna take, uh, and the, we decided, my parents started farming in the early 1960s. And so that makes us almost a 60 year old farm. Um, and they started using a horse manure as, as the basis of their compost all those years ago. And it was a very primitive kind of composting where they, uh, just made piles of horse manure and bedding and turned it over and spread it on the fields. And over time, what happened was that we got out of balance and we had pretty high phosphorus levels. And uh, a lot of things that we were growing stopped being quite as vigorous and as dependable as we would have hoped. And so at the time, we had a new farmer joining us named Ellen Polishuk, who was a young sprout. And she she decided that was really going to change our game if we learned how to make compost well and if we figured out what the true science was behind making really good compost so she got she found out about these people named the loop keys who are in austria and she went to a two-week training session in pennsylvania i think it was and was just totally jazzed about it and totally said, this is it. We have discovered the answer to the question. And what it meant was making a really big investment in our um, infrastructure to, to become the, the source of our own nutrients and to become our own nutrient managers. And it was a big leap for us. That was in the mid 1990s. So that's, third, that's some number of years ago, um, 25 years ago. And it was a big, leap for us to become completely responsible for our own science basically and um we 
we grow 20 acres of diversified vegetables on two different farms. And we have about 40 employees that are mostly seasonal. And at this point, we have about eight of us or six of us who know we're going to come back every year. So there's a, there's a, there's a pretty good solid knowledge base on our farm now. And, the, and part of it is that some of us have grown up here. I'm one of the people who grew up on this farm. And my nephews have grown up on this farm. And we have a couple people who have been working here for 15 years or something, or at, at least 15 years. So there's a lot to be said for continuity in your, in your institution. And one of the things that comes out of that is people get to be skilled in certain areas that are really important to your farm business. And for us, we have, when Ellen left, she was here for over 20 years. When she left, we lost the brains of the compost operation. And we, she tried to teach us what we needed to know to be able to keep making compost. But little by little, we came to realize we didn't understand enough. We didn't have a great enough grasp of the really workings of compost. And so one of us, my nephew, went to compost school this winter. And, um, really learned enough to help us get back on track and make, you want to show the picture, Neve, of um, the scale of compost that we make on our farm, um, to to become more confident that the, the, the recipe we were using was really going to be functioning well for us. And so this is our, this is our compost turner, which is a sand burger, which is 25 years old and kind of rickety by now, but still doing a great job. And so the You'll hear all about how compost is made and how what the ingredients are. But for us, the, the critical, there's a couple critical pieces. And one is the regular turning and the measuring of the CO2 and the moisture and just making sure that all that's being managed well. And because we've got a grip on it now, our compost is being made in a very predictable manner. And the way we use it because of food safety issues, we're kind of conservative. And so what we do is we make compost in the spring and compost in the fall. And so the piles that are made in the spring are spread in the fall for planting the following spring. So it's a kind of a long cycle between the compost that's made and the compost that's being grown in. And we keep it covered with a very heavy blanket all summer long or all winter long, a blanket that um, keeps out all those things that want to poop on there and walk all over it. For some reason, every compost pile is a huge attractant for every animal that wants to run all over them and poop on them. Um, so we, we plant into compost that's at least 180 days old. That's that's kind of the way we do it. And also, most of our fields are mulched with hay or plastic mulch. So there's very little bare ground growing that we do, and almost nothing would have a splashing component to it. So we're very conscious about the food safety stuff because it's come up, and it keep you know it's going to be an issue forever for all of us. Um, but we're really confident that our compost is healthy, is doing a good job. Um, the way we spread it, uh, there's kind of a, our farm has both kind of hand, on your hands and knees kind of scale and big tractor kind of scale. And so when we're in our tunnels and our hoop houses and in our small bed gardening, we're using a five gallon bucket and we're walking down the patch with shaking it out like fairy dust on the ground. Um, and it's heavy. It's a very heavy compost. So you can only carry about a half a five gallon bucket at a time. But our real production is done by using a front end loader and a um, chicken litter spreader. So you're, so the container is about, holds some five tons and we spread 10 tons per acre, which sounds like a lot, but when you spread it on the ground, it practically invisible at 10 tons per acre. And our compost is not, it's not meant to, um, it's not soil, it's an inoculant. It's something which, which, creates a lot of activity in our soil and makes it much more alive than it would be without that. So it's, it's some people think of compost as like a replacement for topsoil, or I, I don't really understand what they think it's supposed to be, but they think they put it on really thick. And for us, it's, it's a, it's a livener, it's an energizer of our soil. And um, because of all the microbial activity. So it's kind of, it always feels like very dust to me when we put it out because it's practically it's like you just can't even see it when it's, I mean, you can see it, but it's, 
it's a it's a little bit like magic. And I, I told Neva, I'm I'm the end user in this. I'm not the person who creates the compost. I watch it being made. I I certainly think it's beautiful, but I'm not the compost maker. And um, we depend on it completely for our nutrients. In addition to that, we use um, a custom blend from Midwestern Bioag, which they, they tell us, they help us to create the right amount of trace elements that go out to our soil. Ellen's told us a thousand times, you know, there's there's a three-legged, it's a three-legged stool and one of them's compost, that's the biological one, but there's still the physical one and there's still the chemical one. And so, um, but the compost is really our, our primary source of the goodness that goes into our soil, in addition to our cover crops, which, uh, we do. We alternate cover crops with cash crops for a full season on our farm in in Purcellville, which is a long wait for those cash crops. But we so we'll put compost down in the fall. We'll put our cover crop in for the winter. We'll take out that cover crop in the spring and plant a cash crop. Then we'll put another cover crop in, then we'll have a long winter of cover crops. So it's just a long cycle between cash crops and the compost really for us only goes in in relation to the cash crop. It doesn't go in in relation to the cover crop. I don't know if that makes sense. But um, so that's us. We are a pretty, uh, for this area, we're a pretty big operation. I don't know about the for the world, but for this area, we are we're relatively substantial in terms of the amount of vegetables that we move through our farm and without the compost I don't know how we would do it I don't know I don't know what you do when you don't have good compost I'm not sure what the answer to that is um so that's that's my my overview um I think I was supposed to make sure that you understand that as a farm entity it's not important for every person on your farm to be an expert in the science of the compost making. It's important for everyone to believe in it and it's important for everyone to be dedicated to using it well and to being supportive of it. But only one or two of you really has to know everything that it takes to make really good compost. And the rest of you can concentrate on all the other things that are super important in a farm because you only need to be the most amazing generalist there is to be a successful farmer. So that's my, that's my little speech on don't try to do it all yourself. Thanks, Hannah. And so, you know, if a person doesn't, you can't specialize in everything um, yourself, if you're a one person or a two person show, then there are, you know, consultants that you can reach out to for advice and information as well. It's really great because you know, Hannah's farm is so large, they're able to sort of specialize with different skill sets. Um, and, and yeah, that everybody recognizes the importance of it is, is huge. Um, you guys are a shining beacon, Hannah. Thank you so much for being here to, to share. And I imagine there might be questions that people have about application or timing or other things. So thank you for being here for the Q&A too, just in case there are questions that are from the farm end of things that, that come up. Um, so uh, we will at this point shift uh, gears into uh, Lindsay Gilmore's presentation on the food safety components, right? So it's like you, you know that there's a lot of nutrients and goodness in using manure-based compost, but how do you do it in a way that's safe for, for humans? And uh, Lindsay will share this. So let me make you co-host and you are. Great. I am already, yep. Thank you, Lindsay. Okay. So I just want to say up front that I'm a dedicated home composter, <clears throat> lasagna method. Um, I love the process of waste being broken down into soil. And um, when I had a catering business years ago, I also grew a lot of compost because I hated to throw away all that food waste. So I love compost. And I also have had to, you know, learn how it can impact um, the food safety on farms. So along with all of the benefits, you have to be aware, as with anything in food safety, you have to um, assess the risks on your farm of the various things that you do. It doesn't mean you can't do any of them. You just have to be aware of the risks and figure out ways to reduce it. So first of all, you probably all know that, um, oh, and I should say, actually, I'm gonna be talking about 
raw manure as well as manure-based compost and a specifically compost that has not been, been treated using a scientifically valid method, which is what you're gonna be hearing about today. So uh, if you're using the lasagna method as I do, then, and you're putting raw manure in that pile as I do, my neighbor's chicken manure and others, um, then you have to treat it like raw manure. So I'll get into that. Um, so there's a lot of different microorganisms, many, most of them beneficial. We were talking about, about that before we got started. Most of them are either benign or, be, or beneficial. Probably they all have some important role to play. But there, here's a little sampling of the kinds of things that are human pathogens that you may find um, in animal and human, uh, animal and human poop, basically. My job, as I always say, is about following the poop when I'm helping people with food safety. So um, for those of you that are, have learned anything about the Food Safety Modernization Act, Produce Safety Rule, uh, or those of you who are, actually have to comply with that rule, it's important for you to know what, how the FDA defines raw manure. So it's basically actual raw manure and it is incompletely composted manure. So if you, if you can't prove that you've used a scientifically valid method um, through describing the process and having records of the process, then it will be considered incompletely composted manure. Even if it's manure that you've added to other composting materials, you'd still have to treat it like raw manure. So incomplete means composting using a passive or non-scientific method, such as piling it up, piling up your manure or your animal bedding or adding raw manure to your compost pile and then just letting time, rain and sunlight do the work. And microorganisms, I, I left that out. <laughs> There's a lot of microorganisms doing the work as well. And if compost is made from only vegetative materials or it's composted using a valid scientific method, such as the National Organic Program. Um, you know, I'm not gonna get into that today because I believe Gary's gonna be talking about this, but um, National Organic Program requirements um, are a good example of valid scientific methods. And then there are other kinds of methods. Um, then the compost is considered low risk and under the produce safety rule and generally under GAP, good agricultural practices standards, there are no restrictions on the timing or, or how you apply it, so when you apply it and how you apply it. However, if this happens, and, you know, as Anna said, that Hannah said, they're, they're, they keep their compost piles covered to prevent, this is a particularly egregious, <laughs> lots of pigs hanging out on your compost pile is not common on most farms, but any, you know, birds roosting, flying over, other small critters, um, they're all gonna be pooping in your compost pile. So. How long has it been sitting there and is it available as basically a toilet for many other critters is going to help you decide how safe that compost is, even if you, you have only added vegetative matter. So if the manure is composted using a valid scientific method, then FDA produce safety rules and GAP standards require you to have uh, treatment records. And this is, is an example of a log that you can keep to show your compost treatment records. Gary may have um, other treatment logs that you could use. This is something that we'll be sending to you uh, after, the, after the webinar, along with other resources. So you need treatment records to prove the compost treatment is scientifically valid. And if you purchase compost, you need annual documentation from the manufacturer that certifies that it was properly treated, handled, transported, and stored. So if you're buying, and, we, and there's a question that came up that we hopefully will get to later about buying compost, you need to know if it has that compost been sitting around outside uncovered for long periods of time, is it stored that way by the vendor, in which case it may not be considered um, a benign compost, a, you know, a, it's no longer uh, composted sufficiently it's been re, we don't want to use the word contamination, but it's been pooped in again by other creatures, basically. Comes back to the poop. So if you do use raw manure or incompletely composted manure, 
you need to be aware of where you could be cross-contaminating. So the bacteria and, and uh, in some cases, you don't really have viruses in this instance, but um, parasites are gonna get spread through water, through human hands and clothing and shoes and through equipment not being cleaned properly and also contaminated irrigation and wash water. And then you need to think about the relative risk of contamination. This is true for food safety in general. So the closer something grows to the ground, the more likely it is to become contaminated and the more often it's associated with outbreaks. So you know that cantaloupe melons and uh, um, why am I blanking on that lettuce that we've had multiple Romaine. Romaine lettuce. So things that actually grow close to the ground are more likely to be contaminated. And of course, compost is applied to the soil. So another important factor is the timing of your application. And um, while there are no strict rules yet about this, other than in the National Organic Program, you can follow the NOP regulations. And this is what's recommended currently while there is more scientific research being done into the risks with raw, raw manure. So it's apply and work the soil, work into the soil no less than two weeks before planting, at least 120 days before harvest where the crop touches the ground and 90 days before harvest where it doesn't touch the ground. Um, and as Hannah was talking about their timing for applying compost, that's a very, very safe way of doing things. So you definitely have that 120 or 90 day interval between application and harvest. And for a lot of the, I'm in Pennsylvania, actually, I'm in Philadelphia, and I work with a lot of Amish farmers who spread raw manure, and many of the farms are spreading raw manure. Uh, and so they usually do it at the end of the growing season. So by the time they're harvesting their crops the following year, um, there's been plenty of time for the manure to break down. The other thing is to think about how your method for spreading, so how you're spreading the manure, do you have a, a big truck spraying liquid manure, which is more likely to get spread a greater distance, could possibly contaminate neighboring crops, could possibly get blown by the wind. If it's, hopefully farmers are not doing that on a windy day, but you need, you need to know what your neighbors are doing. Um, if you're doing it by hand, of course, you can have much more control, but that's a less efficient way of doing it. If you have a smaller spreader like this photograph here, um, you, again, you can, you can gauge how far that manure has been spread much more easily than with a large spreading um, process. If you come into contact with the raw manure, so is it getting on your hands, your shoes, your clothes? Um, are you, do you have any protective gear that you're using when you're handling the manure, when you're shoveling it, when you're spreading it? Um, do you have alternative clothing protective clothing and then alternative shoes and clothing and so on to change into afterwards. I would say that actually the disposable gloves are not the best kind of glove to use. In this case, you probably want to use gardening gloves, but those you can also throw in the laundry or if they're really heavy rubber gloves, you could wash and sanitize them. And then how are you storing the protective clothing and shoes? Um, the, the photograph on the right is a very common site at a farm, I will say. I won't tell you whose farm this was. And um, you can see that it's not the safest way to store things that might, when someone's been walking through the chicken house or messing with the raw manure, you really want to be thinking about how you could be leaving contaminants around to be walked out back, walked back out into the field or driven right back out into the crops. I think you've all probably heard enough about hand washing this year. Um, I hope you're all doing it. I hope you're doing it after you work with manure or compost and before working with produce. And I hope you all know how to do it properly. And you want to make hand washing as easy as possible. So do you have a if you need to, do you, can you create a portable hand washing station so people can wash their hands without really even have to, having to think about it? It's on their way back to the produce handling areas. And then where is your manure stored? Um, is there any possibility of runoff or drift? 
uh, in this photograph on the right from the Wild Farm Alliance. I really recommend you reading things from the Wild Farm Alliance on food safety and conservation, really, really cool stuff. But you can see that here there's compost windrows. They've got a windbreak between that. Then they've got crops that are typically not eaten raw, such as uh, potatoes, squash, winter squash, etc. And so there's a big buffer zone. There's a windbreak and a buffer zone before you get to the, the vegetables that are typically eaten raw, such as leafy greens. So that's, that's kind of a smart way of thinking through um, where your crop plan uh, in relationship to where you have your compost stored. And, and the photograph on the left, you just see a big pile of compost that is uphill from leafy greens. That, and when you've got rain and wind, it's not covered. You've got rain and wind, it could easily be leaching down into the, uh, the crops. And also because it's uncovered, even if it's finished compost, it could be getting pooped on by all kinds of creatures and pooped in by all kinds of creatures. Is there a risk of walking or driving through your raw manure? Um, is there a way to avoid this? Uh, I quite often have seen raw manure piles or compost piles piled up along the side of farm lanes. And if it's on the uphill side of the farm lane, once again, it's gonna get leached over the farm lane where people are walking and driving. So you wanna think about where, where have you positioned those piles? And then if you are driving through it, if it's not something you can avoid, um, can you check for contamination? Can you wash, you know, spray off really well and possibly even sanitize equipment if you need to? If you're going to be driving that tractor out into the crops, crop fields, you probably want to give it a really good cleaning before you do that because it's right by the cow barn, the dairy barn there. And then do you have dedicated equipment for working with and around raw manure and compost? Um, can you keep that separate from your crop if your produce handling equipment on a very small farm, you may not be able to do that. So can you clean and sanitize between uses? Can you make sure you're not using the same pitch, using a pitchfork in raw manure and then taking it over to finished manure so that you're, you're walking possible pathogens over from the unfinished compost to the finished compost? Clean that, either use a different fork or implement or clean and sanitize it between uses. I don't have any pictures of uh, compost piles right next to water. If anybody has one, please, please send them to me. Um, this is just another thing to think about. Are your water sources protected from manure sources or manure piles? Of course, these are two really obvious examples of water possibly being, con definitely being contaminated by animal manure. And this is something I come across with farms too, that Oftentimes poultry is being used to clean up harvested fields and add compost along the way, pooping as they go. And if you're doing this, then you have to think about that raw manure interval between um, uh, planting and harvesting, 120 days or 90 days. Uh, if you use raw manure, incompletely composted manure, and you wanna get GAP certified, then you actually need to have application records and that would be documenting which crop, um, what, what kind of soil amendment you're using and the timing and method of application. Um, sometimes you may even wanna put, and this is actually useful information for your own purposes. You wanna be able to see from year to year, the impact of adding um, raw manure, composted manure to your crops. And, I, and for organics, you're, you're already keeping these kinds of records, but if you're not certified organic, you may wanna think about keeping them so that you can see what your return on, on work and return on investment is. And then bottom line, um, as I said, I'm a big fan of compost. I have very healthy soil in my little garden because of all the compost that I add to it. And um, also micro, microbial diversity, I believe increases competition with human pathogens. So you wanna have plenty of the good stuff to compete with the bad stuff. And same as with, with our bodies, right? And that's me. Um, I am, I have four food safety educator trainees that I work with. Unfortunately, I don't think any of them are on today, but um, we're also gonna be starting a new project soon where we're gonna be training another six community-based food safety educators. So if anyone has, has interest in that, please be in touch. Thanks a million, Lindsay. A question that came in um, during your, your um, presentation was, 
any particular recommendations for what types of covers to put on the compost pile that allows it to breathe but is keeping it safe from contaminants? And maybe if that's something that either you or Gary have thoughts on. Um, I think Hannah probably would know too, since they're actually covering there. Yeah, that, I'll leave that to Gary and Hannah because I'm not, as I said, I'm a generalist, not a specialist. So there is a general product called compost fleece. It has a tendency to let air in and out and shed water. Um, it keeps things from condensing on the fleece, at least a little bit. So it's a fairly good product. It's durable, it lasts for a number of years. We have some at the University of Maryland dairy farm that's must be 20 years old. That's great, yeah, love it when things last that long. Okay, so uh, on that note, actually, um, just for an FYI for people, participants on this call, uh, I'll send a follow-up email with resources that we discussed in this. Um, oh, look, Brenda um, has already shared a link, excellent. But uh, I will still also uh, share a follow-up email with documents um, that are referenced and uh, resources that would be valuable for the things that we touch on today. So. Um, know that that will happen. There will also be a recording uh, and that will be shared too in case um, you um, missed a particular part of the session at any point. Um, but so thank you, Lindsay, for your presentation. And I think at this point we'll um, switch over to Gary. Um, so Gary is a professor at the University of Maryland College Park and uh, he is a composting research um, expert also and a professor. So um, before Gary begins his talk, I just wanted to mention if you have any questions about your farm that pops up as anybody is presenting, please feel free to add your question into the chat box and we'll make sure it get answered. gets answered, thanks. Do you want us to um, send our, well, you already have our presentations. You can certainly feel free to give them to anybody that wants them from me. Excellent, yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna talk about a few things, but I'm not gonna go into great detail on any of them. Any one of these three things up there would make a good one hour classroom topic. So you're just gonna get exposed to some things. How do you identify good compost? Where are the resources to get good compost? And what's the impact of regulations in Maryland? So for Hannah, these regulations don't affect her because she's in Northern Virginia. So first quality question is, well, what are you gonna use compost for? And so a compost for one use might be not very good at all for another use. Um, the compost that you saw that Hannah was making is of excellent quality. This is the first time I've seen an animal manure compost that good. Uh, Part of it is due to that spreader she was using or that um, compost pile turner. But you have to define it for the intended use. So what is your use gonna be? Is it going out on crops? Well, that's a different use than if you're gonna be using it on a soccer field in Montgomery County because the soccer field in Montgomery County is gonna have the soccer mom looking at it and that soccer mom is not gonna be happy if there's plastic in it, if there's glass in it or something else. But if you're growing a vegetable crop and you've got little crumbles that get glass in your compost, it's not that big a deal. It's gonna behave like sand. So you need to look at the use. So how will you identify good compost? Here's four things that you can do. You can check a vendor online. Sometimes they have a good online presence, some not. You can check a sample, interview the site operator, but oh yeah, don't forget to ask other people. You have networks when you build, um, when, you, when you go to a, as we do sometimes on the Eastern shore, go to the family restaurant in town, you end up sitting and talking to other farmers. Ask them about where they get something. To check a vendor online, you wanna make sure the firm and its personnel are both certified and licensed. Now, not everybody that works the compost has to be, but if they're selling compost, you want somebody that is certified to be able to operate the site. 
the compo the USCC US Compost Council certifies P or teaches classes to be certified. They are developing certifi certification exams or or licenses. Um, that's kind of in, in progress right now. Does a manufacturer have a seal of approval from a reputable organization? There's three or four that do that. Is the firm a member of a compost related professional organization, meaning that they have networks of people that can help them answer questions? To check a vendor online, ask users and producers. I talked about that. If you call the MDA, at 410-841-2721, you can ask them if there are any complaints about a particular vendor. If you ask them who makes the best compost, they'll tell you, I don't know, because they're not allowed to support someone. But if there's a complaint about them, they're allowed to tell you. Check the Better Business Bureau. Have there been complaints there? <clears throat> If you choose to inter interview the site operator, make sure that you're getting the site operator, the one that is running the day-to-day -day operations. Ask them about the feedstocks. Do they include homeowner lawn clippings? Sometimes homeowner lawn clippings are not good for compost. Do the feedstocks include commercially grown hay? Same thing. Are the animals fed off farm grown hay? Same question occurs. These are all conditions where you might have a problem with the compost. Is a temperature log maintained? We kind of alluded to that earlier, but you should be keeping a temperature log to show that you're doing what you need to do. Does the, pro does the log say that the product reached PFRP? Process for further reduction of pathogens, bad bugs. And that's a time and heat um, condition that tells you that the hot, there's a very high probability that all of the um, pathogens that are harmful have been killed if the process has gone through properly. That's part of the log that Lindsay had talked about. How do you test for quality when you're taking a sample? You have to take a representative sample. The analysis is only good as the sample you take because it represents either one spot in a compost pile or it represents a whole lot of spots that you've been careful about taking. Send it to a reputable lab for testing. A list of compost labs is at this URL here. If you just go to compostingcouncil.org, you can find the list on reputable labs that follow the US Compost Council's uh, protocol for laboratory tests. So, hello, go back where you were. There we go. You're asking these questions. Is it done? Is it stable? Is it good quality? Whatever good quality means. Will it support plant growth? Because you want plants to survive. <clears throat> So one of the questions about a compost sample, is there something in it that's bad for plants? Is there too much salt? Is the pH wrong? Are there pathogens that are gonna affect plants? Because of OMRI and other organic certifications, are there pathogens at all for food safety and health? Is there a bunch of raw carbon that hasn't been broken down yet? That can affect plants in a heartbeat. Um, Typical symptom is that everything you've planted has started turning yellow two days after you applied your compost. Are there herbicides in this compost that are gonna be harmful? Um, Brenda is on the line and Brenda has a fact sheet that can tell you way more than I'm gonna to cover today. But here's the first thing you can do. It's a primary test and it's, will it grow something? So here's a seed test done with styrofoam cups and a little bit of compost, and it's planted to corn, oats, cucumbers, tomatoes, and sunflowers. And as you can see, particularly from the cucumbers and tomatoes, the front line is not responding as well as the back line. If you look at the oats, well, the back line is responding differently. And if you look at the corn, you'd say, 
Jeez, I'm not sure. So some plants respond to problems differently than others. That's why there's a variety of seeds done here. But this test takes, oh, maybe seven to 14 days because different seeds germinate at different rates. And the minute they start growing, you can see something's right or something isn't right. So there's a control. What would you plant into in the control in the back row? Well, I plant into some potting soil because I know that it's been sanitized. You can't sell potting soil without it being um, treated pasteurized. If you send your sample off for a test, you're gonna get reports back. And these reports are gonna tell you about nutrients. That's what's outlined in, N, in, in yellow here. And some physical characteristics such as the pH and the soluble salts and the particle size. It's gonna tell you about whether it's finished or not. Stability says that it's not going to break down much anymore. All the carbon that's available for going somewhere has gone somewhere. Is it mature? In other words, does it have anything in it that's going to need to change in order to allow plants to go on? Usually that something is ammonia. And so those are the two things we see there. And finally, there'll be something that's either pass fail about pathogens and trace metals. You can attest the uh, maturity in the farm yourself with a Solvita four hour quick test. And it'll tell you exactly the conditions of both maturity and uh, completeness, stability. So these two test strips look at ammonia and carbon dioxide. If it's not breaking down much anymore, then there's not much carbon dioxide coming off because the microbes don't have anything to feed on and they give off carbon dioxide when they feed. What is an herbicide residue? There are some herbicides that have turned out to be rather persistent. They don't break down during the compost process. They don't break down when they go through an animal's gut. These persistent herbicides, a typical one is called chlorpyrrolid, chlorpyrrolid, I cannot pronounce it ever. And it's a pretty persistent two years at least herbicide. So herbicides in, injure these sorts of things and lots of other things. This is just a partial list. They're traced to compost produced from yard trimmings and from livestock manure and bedding, both. So the source affects it, but there's lots of compost made with both of these products that don't have herbicides in them. How would you check for herbicides? Well, peas are a good thing to check for herbicides. You plant peas and do that same test and they're gonna come up curled and damaged if there's anything that looks like persistent herbicides and they're gonna come up with their leaves outreaching and growing. And you can see that the number and height of the leaves are a little bit healthier here to say the least than this slight effect. So it's a pretty simple test, anyone can do it. You can't tell exactly what it is without spending a fortune, but you can tell that there's something there that I don't like. Finally, what about contaminants? There's metal, glass, plastic fragments, all sorts of things. The metals give a potential for physical injury and you can get them from trash, from demolition materials, medical waste. You can get it from baling wire and that can be in any stall. Cafeteria waste. I look at cafeteria waste frequently. I could not find the picture of a pile of compost with a fork sticking out of it, but there was, there is one that I really wish I could have found. That's the disadvantage of not being in my office. And they, can, and they can get waste from stalls and stanchions. I got a bale of straw from Pennsylvania from a horse farm. That straw had a entire uh, bar from a uh, horse stable. Apparently there'd been a problem. They took the bar off and just dropped it in. It got swept up into the litter and it came out in a bale that was really gonna damage my ma machinery if I didn't catch it in time. Glass happens a lot. Glass bottles are broken all the time and glass can end up in compost. We try hard to keep it out, but it does occur. 
glass is another form of sand. It's the same chemical, silicon dioxide, and it is small chips that behave like sand, but those small chips on an athletic field can cut up a child's knee in a hurry. So depending on where that compost is going, you wanna be careful of whether there's glass in it or not. There are aesthetic issues, plastic film, trash bags that have decayed somewhat are an, an issue at all large compost sites if they take in any waste from anywhere else. If you're bringing your own crop waste in and animal waste, you probably won't ever see this problem, but you will if you take it from the general public. There's a um, limit to the amount of total inerts, which is the metal plus the glass plus the plastic. It's supposed to be 1% by weight or less. What are some desirable properties of compost? Those same reports can give you that. And what, what is typical for pH is between 5 and 8.5. We'd like to see it between 6 and 7.5. Uh, personally, I don't mind if compost is between six and 8.3, because 8.3 in our soils, which are usually acid, is gonna be okay. It, EC is electrical conductivity. If it's less than four, that's the amount of salt that's in it. And if it's less than four, most plants can handle it. Some plants are sensitive and it should be less than two if you're dealing with that. Unfortunately, grass can be one of those. So if it's an ornamental operation that the compost is going to, prefer to have it less than two. Organic matter is gonna be 30 to 70%. We prefer it to be greater than 50% on a dry weight basis. It'll probably be about 40% or less on a wet weight basis. What's the water holding capacity? Anything greater than 100% is fine. Moisture content is somewhere between 30 and 70, but we would like it to be around 40% or 50%. If you use a compost turner, like you saw in Hannah's slide, you'll see the water content being lower than if you turn it with a front end loader. And that'll give you a better product, one that's more pleasing and not as heavy to handle. So there's a bulk density that you'll get a reading on somewhere between 800 and 1,000. Um, what are some other variables? Nutrients, 1% nitrogen up to 3%. That's the general area. If it's an animal manure, then the nitrogen tends to be a little higher. For most of my applications, I prefer to have higher nitrogen because uh, I'm gonna be using it to grow something pretty quickly. Uh, particle size, you know, I probably should have looked at that a little more carefully. That should be one inch minus screen, not one foot. <laughs> Slight error there. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about trace elements because if we get into using biosolids and sewage sludge compost, there's a whole nother thing I got to go on for a long ways. We have somebody from Bloom, which is DC Waters uh, biosolids product. Uh, we could do a whole seminar on Bloom. We want it to be stable and we want seed germination to occur. You notice I've talked about plant bioassays a couple times. It's so quick and easy to do that I just urge you to do that so that you can catch a problem before it goes out the door. You don't wanna sell something bad because it's gonna come back to haunt you for years. That goes on to marketing and I'm not a marketing expert. <clears throat> Where can you get standards? Well, standards are developed by the US Composting Council and you can see them, they're called TMEC test method for examination of composting and compost. It's a laboratory manual. USCC puts out something called the seal of testing assurance. Other seals of approval, Woods End Research Laboratory, California Compost Quality Council. You can get seals of approval from them also. Where do you get good compost? Well, the USCC list lists the people that have STAs, the seal of testing assurance. And for the state of Maryland, there's only five Maryland producers listed. These five are big and government linked. So there's a little bit of money involved which is probably the reason for this. Smaller producers 
I don't know what the problems they would have getting listed, but it would be a, pretty much a free advertising. There's a Maryland chapter of the USCC compost, US Composting Council. This is the email address for them. And the person that answers this email is Brenda Platt. So she's um, able to tell you about other composting sites from her knowledge, which is extensive. In terms of commercial, animal waste compost that's being sold is rare. It's not impossible to find, but it's rare. The term good depends on your use, as I've said before. Up until I saw the compost that Hannah was producing, I haven't seen any animal waste compost that I would use on a soccer field in Montgomery County. Parents are pretty picky. Most all animal waste compost though is suitable for agricultural crops. Where do you find it? Well, ask an extension agent or even better, the county nutrient management plan writer is gonna to have to write this compost operation into the annual nutrient management plan. So the plan writer is gonna know more than any place else where animal compost is being produced. Now we're talking about Maryland. I'm gonna cover these regulations really fast. Um, let's see, I got like three minutes. So we're gonna cover it fast. If you are considering making animal waste compost for sale in Maryland, there are setbacks from the property line dwellings and other places that you have to honor. You have to have run on diversions, runoff control, treatment, distance to groundwater. You have pad requirements and they include the pad slope. It has to be either asphalt or cement and a roof has to be over the active composting area and the feedstock intake area. Contact water treatment has to occur. Pathogen reduction and vector attraction has to recur. We've talked about PFRP already. Vector attraction reduction is usually met pretty well if you've done good pathogen reduction. And there are record keeping and reporting um, requirements that really aren't very onerous. They're pretty easy to do if you keep that temperature log and a few other logs, but you just have to write down what you do as you do it. So are there any questions? I guess we'll wait till the panel for questions, won't we? You're muted. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, so first of all, thanks for covering all of that. And no, I think it would be a good time to do some questions just so that people have a little bit of time to absorb, you know, and think through what, what, what people are hearing or if there are particular things that didn't get addressed um, that you would like to ask. We, I think we have enough time for questions now and then to do a little section again at the end. So one question that came in um, from a panelist during your presentation is um, how far from a well would, it, would you advise having your compost pile be located? I believe the requirement, not advice, but requirement in Maryland is 100 feet. 100 feet. But I would check that because we have 50 foot setbacks, 300 foot setbacks, and 100 foot setbacks for different things. Great. Um, and so just as we're here, um, let's use this next, you know, 10 minutes to ask questions that might be coming up. Um, if you want to take a bathroom break, you know, now's an okay time to do that too. Uh, but I think, so feel free to put into the chat box um, any questions that you have rolling around um, as you approach this webinar today. Uh, and in the meantime, while we wait for people to um, share thoughts, there was one uh, in here about the biosolids um, from April. And I, I know that you touched briefly on that, Gary, but April was wondering if anybody has used biosolids, um, like AKA human manure um, uh, on any of their fields or farms thus far. I can tell you that biosolids is spread on some of the farmland in Maryland. Hmm. I think their crop is usually field corn. Gary, when you say biosolids, is that something that's coming out of a, a sewage treatment? It's a sewage treatment sludge that comes out and gets a little bit 
a little bit more processing. Right. Um, usually dewatered, uh, may have undergone anaerobic digestion. It certainly goes through a belt press to remove any liquid, or, well, to remove maybe half the liquids, but it is further processed. <clears throat> And it, is it subject to, what is it, the EPA? EPA 503B. Yeah. Yes, it is. Okay. So records have to be kept on where it is applied. So the, just so everybody knows, if you're interested in using biosolids, um, you, they do have to, just, and you have to comply with regulation, they have to, uh, comply with that EPA. Eh, I immediately forget these kinds of things. Five part five hundred three biosolids. Five hundred three B biosolids rules, which yeah. means that the metals are traced and kept track of. Mm -hmm. uh, now, biosolids today and biosolids twenty five or thirty five years ago are not the same product. The metals in them are really really low nowadays mm -hmm. because EPA had a source reduction project or pro program, and it was costing producers five to $10,000 a day to have metals treated. So they just got rid of them in their product. Mm -hmm. And the biosolids today are much, much safer in terms of metals. Mm -hmm. But that's not what other people view it as. And I should say, you, you have to, they have to comply with that EPA rule if you're using them on ed human edible crops. Yeah. Um, they have to keep track of the metals no matter what. Right, okay. Um, the Bloom product may not have those same restrictions on it. I'm not sure because uh, it is heavily processed. Mm. So it's really been processed differently. Well, and April's saying here that it goes through thermal hydrolysis. Right. So no pathogen survives. So basically it's cooked. Most compost has low or no pathogens right after it's composted. Right. But then recolonization can occur. For Hannah's benefit, this is a field with um, six tons per acre of poultry litter compost. She had asked, said she hoped that there was a picture of one. This is what six tons per acre looks like. That's why she calls it fairy dust. It's just barely there. So I'll just interject because we're getting some pretty great questions coming into the chat box from people. Um, and I'll, I'll go ahead and say if people would like to unmute themselves to ask themselves too, that's great. So Val, if you're here and want to unmute yourself to ask your question, please do. I'm not sure, maybe she's not able to. So I'll read hers. It says, um, can I mix lime in my compost to alkanize uh, the pH? There's no regulation that says you can't, certainly can. Um, we, we have mixed fertilizers all over the place. That's just one more. Okay, um, that was a, a pretty quick one. So then moving to Kathy Hudson, uh, so Kathy, I did send your email to um, uh, Gary and Lindsay beforehand, so they have had the chance to read this here. Um, Gary, do you remember that a question that was sent in? Uh, it was about this specific compost that had high pathogens and high... Um, um, it was high, it's in oh, the... Oh, fecal coliform and salmonella, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so just as an FYI people, um, so a woman was looking to purchase compost for her vegetable farm and the lab results uh, showed high fecal coliform and salmonella. Um, so wondering if that's normal for compost. Uh, what, what I would say is I would ask the producer, how long has this stuff been sitting around? Because when you put compost out that has no fecal coliform to speak of in it, it gets recolonized by birds, by worms, even insects. And so the fecal, or the, yeah, the fecal coliform level begins to increase if it's sitting out in the open. And so if it sat around for a long time, it could get recolonized to that high level of fecal coliform. Because a, a thousand uh, fecal coliforming units per kilogram, that's not a high, 
high level. I mean, it could go to 50,000. So that's not a huge level. Um, this the is salmonella is different. Ram, 2,800, 2, most probable number per gram. Yeah. That, yeah, that was the salmonella, I think. No, that's the fecal coliform. That's the fecal coliform. Okay. Salmonella is three most probable unit per four grams. Yeah, and, and to me, that's still a concerning level because I really want to see salmonella at zero. Mm -hmm. um, what, what did that? I'm guessing the compost PFRP wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. I would treat it like raw manure. Absolutely. Okay, so as long as it's be, for a food crop. So it still could be put on the field, but I would just have to wait the 90 or 120 days minimum. Exactly. Oh, okay. Yep. I would divert it to an ornamental crop if I could. Look elsewhere? <laughs> no, I, I'd divert it to something like growing flowers, growing turf grass, something like that. Or, or you could use it on a crop that's typically cooked. Yeah. But I, I mean, I think considering that people put raw manure on and use the 120 day 90 day interval i think you're pretty safe there's got because raw manure is definitely going to have <laughs> salmonella and all kinds of things in it yeah. so uh, um it depends it depends on your risk tolerance kathy okay but i think i think using hannah's timetable is a good one for this thank you as we continue through these, um, uh, Gary, would you mind stopping your screen share so people can oh, sure. start chatting? Great. So the next one's on horse manure and, and deworming. Actually, there's two questions on that. Um, yeah. So there's a specific dewormer, like Invermectin. Would, would you mind just going ahead and reading that, Lindsay, as you're talking about it? I'm using horse manure. Horse was dewormed. Will that deworm a chemical breakdown enough so it won't harm the biology of my compost? And then can anyone speak on the composting manure and bedding contaminated with a dewormer like Invermectin? Gary, that can you or Brenda? I know nothing about that particular chemical. Mm -hmm. um, this is Brenda. Me neither. Sorry. But we can we can find out. We can we can um, ask the folks we know at the U.S. Composting Council and see if we can get an answer on that. I, I will say there's, there's so the, the, the Food and Drug Administration Produce Safety Rule hasn't, hasn't really ruled yet on how to use, on the dangers of using raw manure. Um, and I don't know if they're looking into the kinds of chemicals that are given to animals as medicines or yeah, as medicines. Um, typically what we're taught as, as educators is about the bacterial, the, the, the human pathogens that might be in there. So I, I, I just don't, I don't feel like we're well informed enough about that kind of thing. And it's one of the things I would worry about with human manure as well is what, are the, what kinds of pharmaceuticals are people consuming that's then coming out in their waste. And I'm not sure that we know enough yet, but you know, the, the, the National Organic Program standards are saying as long as you use that 120, 90 day rule, I guess they're assuming that the, any chemistry would break down sufficiently. I love it when, when the scientists can't, and the food safety people can't give you a clear answer. Sorry. I'd call a vet. Call a hey, vet. Can you, guys, can you guys hear me? Yep. yep. Um, so I have looked into it. I was just uh, kind of bringing it up as like a topic oh, good. Um, of interest. I have looked into it. Um, like the half life. I don't know. It's it's been it's been studied. And the reason I ask about ivermectin specifically is because it's the most commonly used. It's on the shelf. Anybody that has goats, rabbits, lambs. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's the most commonly used dewormer across the board and um so it has been studied the, the breakdown um i think i think it's almost non-detectable at 283 days i wish i had a link to share right now but if uh 
that's if that's, I find if I find it, I'll I'll send it uh, to me. But, but there's more than twice the long. Yes. So it does, it's around and it does affect earthworms mm -hmm. and it will affect nematode populations. Um, I get my main, my primary manure supply is residential horses, recreational trail riding horses. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know they deworm three times a year and mm -hmm. I'm never sure which loads I'm getting that have the dewormer in there. Right. Uh, but I just added a microscope to my arsenal and I do have nematodes present in all my compost piles. So I'm going to assume because nematodes are the worms, tapeworms are nematodes. Um, so I'm assuming that when you have nematodes in your pile, you're thumbs up. But I don't know. If you want them. <laughs> if you want them. Yeah, if they're bacterial or uh, beneficial nematodes. But if you've gone through PFRP and everything's dead, what does that tell you about the deworming chemical? Yeah, because you can't really. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there's somebody, um, a woman on here who said that, uh, oh, Sally said that um, sheep and goat producers are using a variety of different dewormers these days because the one that you mentioned, Josh, uh, has some resistance issues. Huh. So probably your your point that you're making is valid for all of these other dewormers too um and something oh. to, to consider so um i do remember brenda mentioned that she can check with the council to see if they have any additional information um on this i was remiss to say earlier so um brenda's with the institute of local self-reliance we were talking about that before the webinar started and um, works a lot with gary uh composting issues. Um, and as Gary mentioned, she's on the Maryland Council. So um, Brenda, thanks for reaching out to the council and see if there's additional information. If there's anything that comes back, I'll definitely share it with the group. Um, Elizabeth, I, Elizabeth linked uh, an article on the fate of invermectin in manure composting from Cornell. Uh -huh. Yes, and, that's the study that I was uh, okay. citing. Yeah. That's, that's the most conclusive study, and it wasn't a very broad study. Mm. Hard that, to get funding on that kind of stuff. That's just yeah. one pharmaceutical. Yeah. So we'll do one more, and or I think that was all of the questions. Um, and then we'll turn our attention, yeah, so we'll turn our attention now to the nutrient management um, questions that come up with... Uh, using manure-based compost, like phosphorus levels and things of that nature. So, um, you know, hang on uh, tight if you have additional questions about the compost science or food safety implications, we'll have more time at the end to, to address them. Um, so let me make Brian. Uh, Brian's joining us from University of Maryland College Park as a nutrient management specialist, and I will make him co-host so that he can share his screen. Cool, thanks. Let me get uh, let me get set up here real quick. All right, you guys seeing my slides? Yep. All right. So um, thanks for the intro. So again, yeah, my name is Brian Kalmbach. I'm with uh, the University of Maryland Ag Nutrient Management Program. And so we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, utilizing compost based, uh, manure based compost, as well as, um, you know, raw manure for soil fertility and some of the nutrient management considerations uh, that go along with that. <clears throat> so one of the things I just want to point out real quick, I put um, our web address for our program here um, up on my first page here. So if you're from Maryland, if you're a farmer in Maryland um, and you're interested, either required or just interested in getting a nutrient management plan, um, we do have a staff of plan writers who work in our county extension officers, offices throughout the state. And so if you go to our website, you can um, you know, find contact information about getting in touch with them um, to work on developing a nutrient management plan for you. So just real quick, what I kind of want to go through today, I um, want to talk a little bit about just the, the nutrient content of, of composts and manures, um, and uh, more specifically, the plant availability of some of those nutrients. Um, and then talk a little bit about you know, how do we come up with application rates 
Um, and that kind of plays into, you know, how to interpret your soil test to do so. Um, as well as that, that kind of leads right into kind of talking about phosphorus management and then uh, finishing up with a little bit about cover crops um, related to nutrients. So uh, first thing I think that's kind of important to address is, you know, when utilizing really any, any compost um, or manure is to know what you're putting out there. Um, and really the, you know, the, the best way to do that is to, to get a lab analysis um, that'll cover both your nutrients as well as a lot of the other properties um, that Gary was talking about. And so, you know, in lieu of, of an analysis, you might run into data like what I have up here, which is kind of average nutrient content data. And in this case, this is, you know, 47 compost samples that we used for, uh, you know, developing nutrient management plans in our program. And so we can see that that average value of, of N, P, and K but I think what's kind of more important to point out here is, is the range upon which those, those averages are based. So really for all these, these nutrients, uh, it's based on a pretty wide range. And that's, you know, that's pretty much expected, especially with compost where we have you know, different feed stocks, manures may or may not be involved. Um, so I think this variability is expected. So you know, for what it's worth, data like this may or may not be helpful to you because it may not really be representative of what um, you, know, you actually have in your compost or the manure that you're using. And so if we look at, um, you know, in this case, we're looking at, at raw horse manure, um, some of the average values are actually quite similar as far as nutrient content as it is to compost. But again, those ranges, um, you know, we see big ranges on, on which they're based. Um, and not just within, within species, but among different species, we're also going to see um, you know, differences in nutrient content. You'll often hear that poultry manure is a little bit hotter. You know, it has higher levels of nutrient concentrations. And we, we see that pretty clearly um, in the, the poultry litter samples that we see. They definitely have, have a lot higher levels of nutrients than you would see in, in your typical like horse manures or in a, in a completely composted um, sample. So the point is, is that, you know, you might see averages, but they might not be super helpful to you. And this is just from another data set that I found of compost analyses with some different parameters. And, uh, you know, specifically to point out C to N ratio, that's something we'll talk about a little bit. But again, we see an average here, but that's based on a pretty big range. And if we were to apply, you know, a compost with an 11 to one C to N ratio compared to a compost with a 40 to one C to N ratio, those are gonna behave differently um, in the soil. So I think it's, it's one of those parameters that's pretty important to know what's actually in your product and not just what might be in the average of you know, some other products. And so just a, a, quick, a quick web address um, of, of just some, you know, we kind of compile some prices for, for manure samples, um, which you can also add C to N ratio and usually get a kind of a more complete compost package but if uh, you know, some of the stuff that Gary put out might be a little bit more useful if you're specific to compost, but if you're uh, looking for a nutrient analysis just on manures, this might be helpful too. And there's a, a variety of labs on the list from in the region that'll, uh, um, that will have some information for us. So that's just there for you. So I wanna get into talking a little bit about um, starting off with the nitrogen that we see in, in manure and compost. And this is just a little bit of a graphic that's gonna kind of break down what, you know, what we're gonna see in those, in those piles. So, so starting off, we kind of have our pile of, of compost you know, as it's composting or our manure as it's piling up. And inside that pile, we're gonna have some different pools of nitrogen. Um, so our biggest pool is gonna be that organic nitrogen. And so it's big. It's kind of there in the greatest amounts, but it's also, I have it showing up there in red because it's not directly plant available, right? So our plants can't actually access that organic nitrogen. It has to be transformed so the plant can actually take it up. In that pile, we might also see uh, some inorganic nitrogen. You might see some ammonium nitrogen and potentially in lesser amounts, you might see a little bit of nitrate, um, residual nitrate also in that pile but those inorganic forms are directly plant available and can be taken up by the plant when it's applied. So that total nitrogen is gonna be both the organic plus our two forms of inorganic nitrogen. And so when we go ahead and actually apply that, you know, some things are gonna start occurring, right? We're gonna, we're gonna apply that pool of organic nitrogen. We're gonna apply 
some of that inorganic nitrogen, you know, just right off the bat when we apply it, we might actually lose some of that ammonium nitrogen uh, as it volatilizes to ammonia gas. So we actually, right as we apply it, we have a, a pathway for loss and that can be managed by actually working it into the soil a little bit better rather than surface applying it. So we have some potential for losses. But what we also have is some potential for crop uptake because as I mentioned, those inorganic forms can be accessed by the plant. But what we're more concerned about is that bigger pool of organic nitrogen that we really want to make available to our crops. And luckily we don't have to do that because we have microbes in the soil that can help with doing that. And those basically that occurs uh, via a, a microbial mediated process called mineralization. So mineralization, you know, essentially is taking, microbes are breaking down those organic compounds and releasing that tied up organic nitrogen into those inorganic forms, first into ammonium and then possibly into nitrate where they can be taken up by the crop. So this is all going on kind of as you apply those sources as a nutrient source. But just the point is that organic nitrogen may not be directly available and needs to kind of undergo some processes first. And so when we wanna consider how much of that nitrogen is actually going to mineralize, you know, we can kind of estimate it based on, uh, you know, what the material is that we're actually uh, applying. And so if we have a truly composted compost, meaning it went through, you know, it, it increased in temperature, some of those things that Gary was talking about to make it a true compost, it actually has a fairly low mineralization rate. We only expect about 5% of that organic nitrogen to actually mineralize and become plant available because it's kind of tied up in those, uh, those stable organic compounds. Whereas when we look at like raw horse manure, a little bit higher at 20%, raw cattle manure, 35%, and poultry litter, um, about 50% of that organic nitrogen is expected to mineralize uh, the year that you actually apply it. And so what about C to N ratio? That's something we mentioned and that plays a role as well. So amendments, meaning you know, that compost or that manure, amendments that have a pretty low C to N ratio, generally below 20 to one, will tend to mineralize nitrogen. And that's what we want, right? Because that's what's gonna feed our crops. But when we have amendments that have a relatively high C to N ratio, so generally above 21, 25 to one, excuse me, um, those amendments are actually gonna tend to immobilize nitrogen. And that's basically just the opposite process of mineralization. So those microbes are actually taking nitrogen that's available in the soil and kind of tying it up for a period of time as it breaks down um, the organic matter. And so just have another kind of simplified graphic to kind of show how that would work with a couple of different amendments. So one amendment A has a high C to N ratio around 30 to one, whereas amendment B has a lower C to N ratio around 10 to one. So we have the same amount of carbon, but but relative uh, greater amounts of nitrogen in amendment B. So when we apply that amendment to the soil, we have our microbes, right? Our microbes are gonna eat up the, that carbon. That's their food source, right? So they can eat up that carbon and those, the populations of those microbes can increase, but just like any other life form, they need nitrogen for their cellular processes, right? So they're gonna take in some nitrogen as their populations increase too. But in situations where that amendment is not providing all that nitrogen, it might actually pull nitrogen from the soil that's already available. And that's kind of what's going on uh, uh, during immobilization. So it's actually taking away nitrogen that might have already been available to your crops from the soil. Whereas if we go over and look at amendment B with a C to N ratio of 10 to one, those microbes are gonna eat up the same amount of carbon. They're gonna eat up the same amount of nitrogen, but they can pull that nitrogen from the amendment and then what's left over, that can actually move into our soils pool and make it available to that crop. So in this case, we're actually providing nitrogen to the crop and that's uh, what's going on during mineral mineralization. So that C to N ratio, particularly for compost is really important to have a handle on because if you are getting a product that ends up with a high C to N ratio, you could then end up kind of starving your crops for a period of time. So just kind of reviewing what we talked about with nitrogen, we have those inorganic forms that are directly plant available. 
We also have the, inner, the organic N, which is gonna be the majority in your manure and compost. And that's gonna be released via mineralization. And that mineralization depends on you know, the type, uh, the species that it came from, or if it's compost in that C to N ratio. And then when we're considering our phosphorus and our potassium, uh, generally we can consider the plant availability to be the same as a fertilizer source, um, kind of on a pound for pound basis. So what about application rates? So applying that, uh, applying that compost or manure uh, you know, as a nutrient source for our crops. Well, it's relatively a simple rule, right? Try to apply based on your crop needs. We wanna consider what that crop actually needs to get maximal production and try to match it. A little bit easier said usually than it actually is in practice. So if we go back to our, our kind of average compost that we looked at at the beginning, when we kind of consider uh, the factors of mineralization uh, for that compost, and we actually consider how much nutrients we're getting on a pound per ton basis, we're only getting about two pounds of nitrogen, 12 pounds of phosphate, and about 18 pounds of potash per ton of material. And if we go and consider, you know, what some crop requirements might be, and we just pulled some cucumbers for a, as an example, we need about 150 pounds of nitrogen, 75 pounds of phosphate, and 125 pounds of potash. And it's pretty easy to see that our ratios don't match very well. And that's, we, you know, that's pretty typical of, of really any organic nutrient source that's manure based most often, uh, in most cases, is that um, it's tough to meet the nitrogen requirement. It's easy to over apply the phosphate. So if we were to consider to apply at a rate to meet our nitrogen requirement, we would need something like 75 tons per acre. And that's pretty, uh, that's a lot, right? That's, that's probably unreasonable in a lot of cases. Um, whereas our P-based rate is substantially lower at about six tons per acre, but that would obviously leave some, some nitrogen left over uh, to be applied. And just for kind of reference, that 75 ton per acre rate, while it might seem, you might balk at it, if we consider a 40 pounds per cubic foot density of a compost, that's kind of an average, um, that's about an inch of compost. So an inch layer thick would be that, about that 75 ton per acre rate. Now, what we also need to consider here is kind of our, our soil test category, right? So our soil test is gonna tell us how much phosphorus and potassium we already have in the soil um, available to our crops. And so in a low, you know, when we have a, a low category, um, a low amount of nutrients available to our crops, then when we apply more, that yield response from our crops is pretty likely. And as that soil, soil amount increases or that soil test category increases, we're gonna get less and less likely of a yield response by applying uh, more, or more phosphorus or more potassium. So what you can expect is that as that soil test category goes up, our recommendation is going to decrease. And so when we start to run into soil tests that might look like this, where we have uh, you know, phosphorus is, is pretty excessive in this case, um, our soil is pretty much saturated with phosphorus, then our soil test recommendation is going to change. And this is something that we would probably see if we were applying manures or composts at kind of an N-based rate over time. Over time, that's essentially going to lead to increases in our soil test. And that's something that you wanna use your soil test to kind of monitor over time to see if, if you're increasing that to a point where it might become an environmental concern. So that, cucumber recommendation that we were looking at before that was kind of based on a medium soil test category where we, we would still expect a response by applying that phosphorus and potassium that we could get from our, our compost. But if we look over at an excessive soil test FIV, uh, we don't expect a yield increase. So we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't recommend to apply more phosphorus and potassium. So as we do apply it via our compost or our manure, we're just gonna lead to, to increases in our soil test. And so what that starts to get into is thinking about phosphorus management and specifically uh, in Maryland, the phosphorus management tool, um, but that's relative to other states which will have something called the P-index. The PMT is just Maryland's name for a P-index. 
And basically, once we get to a point where there's so, those soil tests are so high that they're starting to become an environmental concern, we look at this P index to kind of see where do we have areas of high source, and that high source is, is the excess phosphorus that's in your soil. Um, and then we also consider some site characteristics um, that look at how likely it is for that phosphorus to transport off of the site and become basically a surface water concern. So basically what we're getting at is if we're continuing to apply kind of closer toward these nitrogen based rates, then eventually you'll get to a point where we're kind of concerned where phosphorus is becoming an environmental concern and we might have to look at these P indexes to see how much of a concern it is actually, it actually is. So the recommendation is to kind of consider, um, consider some of this phosphorus management while your, while your soil test levels are low so as not to kind of cause an issue in the future. And so that being the case, if we're considering closer to those phosphorus based rates, then we might need some additional sources of nitrogen, uh, whether that be another organic nutrient source, a fertilizer source, or maybe thinking about some cover crops. So just wanna kind of talk about some of the different categories of cover crops and kind of how that relates um, to, from, a, from a nutrient perspective. So to start, we have our grasses, our cereal cover crops, um, our wheat, our rye, barley, oats, et cetera. And they have a lot of benefits, right? They do things like reduce erosion, increase organic matter. They might scavenge some nitrogen in the fall if there's excess soil nitrate, and they might improve your soil structure. But what I really wanna focus on with, with grasses from a nutrient perspective is they might actually temporarily immobilize some nitrogen. So like we were talking about uh, compost with a high C to N ratio, grasses and cereals also have a high C to N ratio. So when you terminate that cover crop, work it back into the soil, as that residue breaks down, you might actually be tying up uh, nitrogen that you would want to be available to your crops. So that's just something to consider um, in your cover crop program, especially if you're trying to maximize it for nitrogen um, input into your system. Brian, on, on that note, how long would it take then for the cover crops to break down and not have it immobilized? It would take time. It depends on how much residue you actually have. But um, what you want to consider is that mineralization and immobilization is kind of a, a temperature and moisture dependent process. So when the microbes are actively breaking down that residue, that's around the same time that your crops are going to be in the ground and wanting that nitrogen. So usually if you have a pretty heavy amount of a you know, cereal residue, it might be immobilizing for a good period of time when your crop is actually actively taking up nitrogen. So it's, it's hard to put an exact time frame on it, but usually it's, the timing isn't really great, right? Because the immobilization is occurring while your crops really want that nitrogen. Thanks. So uh, getting into uh, legume cover crops, your clovers, your vetches, your peas. You know, again, you'll see some of those similar, similar benefits, but kind of more focusing on the, on the nitrogen piece of it and the C to N ratio is that legumes typically are going to provide plant available nitrogen to succeeding crops. And again, that's just kind of uh, based on that C to N ratio, legumes have a much lower C to N ratio residue than do grasses or cereals. So it breaks down quickly, it provides nitrogen uh, re relatively readily. Now some drawbacks to that is they tend to have slower growth than the grasses and to maximize that nitrogen, you really need early planting, late termination, because again, the amount of nitrogen you're gonna get is gonna be related to the amount of residue that you're actually are working back into the soil. And then you have your brassicas, your mustards, radish, rapeseed. Again, some similar benefits. Uh, you might have some drawbacks with uh, that they tend to winter kill, but that might also be a benefit. Um, but when we kind of consider the, the nitrogen availability, uh, brassicas tend to kind of fall in the middle as far as C to N ratio is concerned. They don't typically immobilize a whole lot of nitrogen, but they're also not really gonna be feeding a lot of nitrogen either. So they kind of fall in the middle there. And so that kind of leads to the question of like, you know, if, so if you have a legume cover crop, how much nitrogen 
you know, kind of as a fertilizer equivalent, can I expect um, from those different cover crops? So if we look at um, our legume crops, our winter annuals, which are gonna be our cover crops, we can see we have some pretty big ranges there. And again, that kind of touches on, you know, it depends on the planting date, whether it got in early or late in the fall. Um, you know, did you get good biomass production? How late did you terminate it? And it might even depend on how it was worked back into the soil um, after it was terminated. So you can get some pretty big range of estimates, um, you know, but again, it kind of comes down to how much residue you actually have. And then finally, um, you know, a lot of times people are asking about cover crop mixes, right? So we're not always, you know, it's usually not just a single species. We might do a lot of mixes with some cereals and some legumes and some brassicas. Um, and so what we're looking at here is kind of on the, on the bottom, on the x-axis here, you know, the date of the termination and then the plant available nitrogen from the cover crop were zero. And then we kind of have negative getting into a mobilization and then positive getting into mineralization. And so we can see for that cereal crop, the later we let that grow and then work it back into the soil, we're definitely immobilizing a good amount of nitrogen. If we work in about a quarter legumes to that, we see a relatively similar pattern. So if we're, if we're, if we're trying, if our goal is maximum uh, end production for our succeeding crops, then 25% legumes probably isn't gonna do it. We need to get up to uh, closer to that 75% legume where we see we're actually uh, providing some nitrogen rather than uh, immobilizing it relative to what might be 100% legume where we'd get that maximum uh, end production for our next crop. So that's, uh, I think I'm probably out of time. So that's really all I have. Um, so I'll be around for uh, questions and whatnot. Thanks, Brian. Um, that's incredibly interesting. So uh, if you determinate the cereal um, cover crops early enough, though, it's not going to immobilize it um, as extensively. I guess it's like if people are using mixes, though, with the cereals and the legumes, then... Yeah, so there's kind of a balance there. So yeah, if it's, if it's just a, a straight cereal crop, I mean, the earlier termination, I mean, that's obviously not as good for you know, kind of your organic matter benefits and some of those long-term benefits, but from a short-term uh, nutrient availability, yeah, the earlier, the better. But then that you kind of got to weigh that in a mix with, with trying to maximize your, your legume production to, uh, to kind of counteract that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm sure that other people probably will have some questions about this too. Um, so feel free to add them into the chat box if, if you have them. Um, I guess there's also this question, though, if you're doing a rotation where you, your field is resting for a season, uh, then that's not an issue, right? So if you're putting cereal um, cover crops in without the intention of planting into them in the spring um, for a cash crop, then you know it's uh, it's a non a non issue depending on what your schedule is for cover crops versus cash crops. Yeah, but you might be able to terminate that in the fall prior, which will help a little bit of you know, get some time to break down some of that residue in the fall, and hopefully you're not tying it as much, tying up as much in the spring. But mm -hmm. the, again, the thing to consider is that that residue breakdown is also going to be kind of temperature dependent, right? You're not going to get a lot of breakdown in the winter when there's not a lot of soil activity. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if, if that's kind of a goal is to, is to not tie up that nitrogen, it might be worth, you know, terminating in the fall, getting it worked in, um, you know, and trying to eliminate issues the following spring. Interesting. Um, would you mind stopping your screen share so that we're- Oh yeah, sure. See folks. Um, so uh, I think that this is a good uh, point to also mention. Um, so the Million Acre Challenge is a, a group of, of uh, six organizations working together um, in partnership with a, a variety of organizations across Maryland, Delaware, and Virginia to work with farmers that are really interested in soil health considerations. You know, so cover crops obviously being a major piece of this. Um, I'm sure these types of questions will be on, you know, farmers' minds. Um, you know, the balance between organic matter and trying to get biomass versus uh, wanting to have the nutrients available at the right time um, for, your, for your cash crops. Um, so, 
if uh, either Elizabeth or Amanda um, is available in a few minutes, I'll, I'll ask them to share a little bit about what's going on with the Million Acre Challenge. Um, we had another person uh, joining um, who's whose internet uh, is going in and out, Lisa Garfield, she works um, with the Million Acre Challenge and Future Harvest as our, our soil health expert, but um, these rural broadband issues are, are no joke. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of farmers can um, relate to that. So, so her, she unfortunately got dropped. Um, so uh, before we move into um, the questions uh, uh, section and um, Million Acre Challenge sharing their information, I wanted to share one thing in the chat box with you that's very important. Um, so we are able to offer sessions bringing together, you know, experts who can um, touch on all of these topics through, you know, a lot of it is through grant funding and um, we have a, a survey that would be really helpful if before you log off, you're able to, to take just to give a little bit of feedback and share some information about um, your farm operation. And it, uh, it's, it shouldn't take very long. So I'll add that link into the chat box. Um, but uh, while I'm doing that, then uh, I'll pass it over to Josh, who has a question, I believe, for Brian about brassicas. Yeah, I would just, uh, can, can you hear me? Yes. All right, yeah, I was just, uh, I was told that brassicas uh, specifically take up more, more phosphorus than other plants. Um, and, uh, but does, if, if that is in, indeed true, would that require like all the radishes, everything be removed from the field to get the phosphorus off the field? Yeah, so I, I, off the top of my head, I'm not sure as far as like relative to cereals, if, if they're pulling up more, like as far as a concentration is concerned. But yeah, with, with any, anything that you're trying to, you know, remove nutrients off of a field, um, yeah, it requires the, basically a harvest of, of those nutrients and re removing them. So if, so if, yeah, if you had like a, you know, a bunch of radishes that you were able to allow to, uh, you know, grow nice and big to actually remove the phosphorus in them, they have to be taken out of the field. So because basically if you were to let them, let them just break down and let their residue break down, um, that phosphorus is, is really just kind of being cycled back in into the system. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, phosphorus phosphorus builds up quick. Um, it does. And especially yeah. when you're, I don't know, using it the way that the celebrity YouTube farmers would tell you to. And um, you really got to be careful. I've, I ran into it almost right away. My soil test went from low to excessive within just a couple of years uh, with heavy compost application. And, and I've been fighting it. Um, trying to, I, I want to build organic matter in the soil every, every season. I'm trying to build the soil. So I'm trying to put in, implement more cover cropping and heavy cover cropping, uh, especially during the off season. Like right now I have a lot of bit bulk building cover crop out there. And um, yeah, it's, uh, if I can't cycle it off the field, you know, really I want that cover crop residue to just fall right in the field, but that's not doing anything. So really the only way you're removing phosphorus is the crop that gets to your market table. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 unfortunately the case. And it's it's a slow process, you know, even even Just when you're motivates considering me to sell vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Sure. Did anybody else have some follow-up thoughts on that? Many years ago, we were told that we had too much phosphorus and we should start growing a lot of onions. And we did. We became really serious allium farmers and it really did change our soil mix. Uh, the nutrient mix was, we got to be really good onion farmers. <laughs> <laughs> I saw, if, I don't know if I have time to address, I saw another question in here from Brenda about commenting on the fact Although compost, compost itself contains NMP, it can mitigate nutrient problems by preventing soil erosion. 
um, and runoff in the first place and by converting N into a more stable and less mobile form and P into a less soluble form. Um, yeah, that's, that's definitely true to, to some extent. Um, it's, you know, like, like we said with the nitrogen availability, um, particularly with compost, it's undergone that composting process so that nitrogen is kind of tied up into bigger, you know, more resistant organic compounds that are resistant to break down. Um, so it definitely can, can keep those nutrients there and tied up in the organic matter a little bit better. Um, you know, and as far as kind of the erosion and runoff piece, I mean, just having your soil covered, you know, cover crops and things like that, I mean, that's going to help you as much as anything, um, particularly with phosphorus, because, yeah, we do have soluble phosphorus pools, particularly in higher phosphorus soils, um, but we definitely see a lot of phosphorus move with erosion attached to those soil particles. So the most that we can do to mitigate erosion and runoff in the first place yeah, that's, that's gonna hold on to that phosphorus into the field a lot better. And like I said, when we consider you know, phosphorus risk, we're not just looking at the amount in the soil, we're also looking at you know, how likely is it to move off of that site. And so if we're holding on to it better, um, then there's a less risk of it moving off of that site and becoming a concern in our surface waters. The, Brian, I've heard that there were studies that showed um, once your phosphorus level gets to a certain point, like a pretty high point, then it becomes more mobile. So even... Yeah, so that's, that's where that soluble pool becomes a lot more prevalent. Mm -hmm. and, and, and yeah, so we, you know, you can, you can manage the erosion, but if you, if you hit a point, um, yeah, we, can, we start to see more of these, these soluble phosphorus losses too, which is, which is kind of becoming more and more uh, supported uh, in the literature for sure. But to your point, it's like that's why you want to look at these things now before it gets too high on your farm so you have the Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mentioned that 75 ton per acre rate, which, which can equivalent to like an inch of compost, which isn't, it seems excessive, but I, I don't think, I think there's people that wouldn't think that's all that much, uh, at least from, from what I've seen uh, some, some growers do. Mm -hmm. Uh, any other questions popping up for people? Um, so while while people are, are um, marinating, uh, if you'll see in the chat box, I shared the link. It's a short survey monkey survey. If you can take that before hopping off today's call, that would be very appreciated. Um, yeah, so, you know, as we're seeing, there are a lot of uh, facets to skillfully using compost, right? Um, there's a lot to consider. And, you know, we were weighing, is it too much to share as much information as we did today? Today's kind of like this, you know, very broad overview of all of the things to be thinking about. But the nice thing is that we have, you know, all of these folks in the area, like today's panelists, who can offer um, experience and thoughts on, on the different pieces. So you're not in it alone. You know, we have the emails here for everybody who presented and you're very welcome to, to reach out to folks. And we have these slides to share, but uh, it, it is something to be thinking through, right? You know, how are you managing these various pieces on your, on your farm? Um, and, uh, uh, Brian, did you have any thoughts about, or did you want to share a little bit about um, how you go through your nutrient management planning process with farmers? Is there a certain, like, pe do people just reach out to you when they have questions, or is there a certain time of year you would really want people to reach out to uh, start that process? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, if, if you're interested in, in getting in touch with someone in our program um, to get a nutrient management plan, or I think this would go with, you know, even in other states, if you're just reaching out to a to somebody to, to work on nutrient management with, um, you know, you're gonna you're gonna need to basically know what you know what crops you're planning to plant, what your nutrient sources are, um, and particularly with kind of these organic type produce operations, that can be a long list of both crops and nutrient sources. So, so you know, somebody that you're working with to develop your nutrient management plan is gonna want to understand what your current system is, um, and then and then kind of you know, see how that, how that works out from a, um, from a planning perspective. And if, you know, if there's adjustments to be made one way or the other. So getting in contact with someone kind of maybe in the fall 
over the winter season. You know, now is a good time if you're trying to put together a plan for the next growing season. Um, you know, don't wait until kind of March and April when, uh, you know, you're going to be busy and a planner might be busy with a lot of other people coming in that time of year. Um, get in contact with someone now and, and, and have some information about what you're doing currently to, uh, because a, a plan is, is you know, it, we want it to be, to, to fit your operation as best it can, right? We want to write it for what you're doing and not what we think you're doing. Um, so understanding what you're growing and what nutrient sources you have and what cover crop practices you have and what your soil tests look like, um, all of that is going to go into the planning process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously, you'll, if you reach out to someone, you'll get a lot more details than that. But that's, you know, in the gist of it, we're just kind of looking at your, your operation and, and what practices that you're doing related to nutrients and seeing if, um, you know, if, if A, there's some ways we can, we can consider other practices that might be better or B, maybe, maybe there's some, some environmental concerns that are going along with your practices and maybe we should, you know, brainstorm some other things. Thank you. Yeah. And something to keep in mind too, right, is that not, it seems like, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, but my understanding is that not every new nutrient management planner is familiar with every scale of farming. And so it, it's, it's worth taking some time to make sure you find a nutrient management planner that understands the, the style of farming that you're doing. Um, I, I think that um, uh, Potomac Vegetable Farm has worked with Ellen Polishok. Um, and so she's a great person to reach out to. I'm sure Brian, like you would be able to recommend nutrient management specialists that understand different types of farming styles, but, but that is something to keep in mind. Um, you know, nobody knows every farming operation uh, or, or type of approach to farming. Um, and, uh, and so on this note, I know that the Million Acre Challenge is also going to be uh, working on some nutrient management planning as part of the, the challenge. So um, for those that are interested in soil health, I'll just turn it over to um, Amanda Cather briefly, who's the director Oh, sorry, to, to Elizabeth? Okay, to Elizabeth Beggins. Um, she is the uh, uh, person who is working with um, Ches Chesapeake Bay Trust on the Million Acre Challenge as the Agriculture Outreach Specialist. And I'll let you share a few thoughts on that, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, just to clarify, I know it's easy. There's a lot of um, different organizations in Maryland. So it's, I'm the agriculture outreach specialist with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, um, as opposed to the trust, just that's easy to easy to mix those up. Um, and the Bay Foundation is one of the Million Acre Challenges, six founding partners. Um, the others are Future Harvest, uh, uh, the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research, um, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, Future Harvest, and the Hatcher Group. Um, so if you run across any of us, and there are three of us who are full-time staff, that, that would be me, Amanda Cather, and Lisa Garfield, who's the one who was having connectivity issues today. The three of us are full-time with this project, um, Neve and Caroline and um, Sophia and many others who are with those other founding partners are also providing support through their roles. Um, so if, we, if you look for us and we have different email addresses, that's why we all have um, different associations with the founding partners of this project. So that seems to bring some confusion. So I just wanted to offer that. Um, so the Million Acre Challenge, um, our goal is, um, let's see, to really help farmers explore soil health um, in ways that help improve um, their crops and their livelihood and their profitability um, while also contributing to positive environmental outcomes. And we really see farmers as part of the solution. So we want to work together to um, move towards profitability and building soil health at the same time. Um, I think uh, many of you may already have heard about our, two of our key um, uh, initiatives. One are our soil health hubs, which are um, organizing regionally. So we're meeting both regionally and um, statewide at times. Right now, everything is virtual, of course. Um, but that just gives us the opportunity to connect with folks when we are able to be in person again in ways that feel accessible to everyone across the state of Maryland. And um, our Soil Health Benchmark Study, which is actually 
sort of a PASA, Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Ag, a PASA initiative, but it's being spearheaded by um, Lisa Garfield through Future Harvest. And um, through that, we are we have a cohort of farmers and farms who are um, engaged in soil testing to really try to get a sense of where uh, soil health is on their farms and across the state um, over um, a three-year period period of time, which is what we're funded for at this juncture. Um, we also have some other interesting things. We have a lunch and learn happening every um, second Wednesday of the month through June. And we have a video contest for soil health. Um, curious folks who want to submit short videos and might win 50 bucks. Um, I don't want to take up too much time. Amanda, what have I left out? Um, I uh, you've really hit on it. We, so the, the Million Acre Challenge, our kind of ultimate goal is to grow soil health and regenerative agriculture on 1 million acres across Maryland by 2030. And that's, it's a really ambitious goal because it's about half the agricultural land in Maryland. So uh, as we roll out our website and the, and the enrollment form for farms to kind of enroll in this challenge, uh, we hope that you will help us, um, all the farmers, um, on the call and all the service providers who work with farmers. Um, and the goal there will be to help farmers develop tools and skills and resources to manage their farms from the soil health management kind of point of view. And all of us know farmers are managing their farms from a million different points of view. And the good news about soil health is that it kind of is a win-win when you manage for soil health you get a lot of additional benefits, as, as Elizabeth said, in terms of profitability and resilience and um, healthy crops. And so we are really uh, looking forward to enrolling a lot of farmers in that challenge. And hopefully also, um, yes, Kathy, we, we are interested in smaller urban farms. Like the, the goal is a million acres, but we, <laughs> we are, we'll take every single acre. Um, we, or half acre. Or half acre, or <laughs> we are really looking at um, kind of farms whose goal is is income generation rather than like a backyard garden. Um, and we are currently focused uh, in Maryland, although as Neve mentioned, we really do, we want to create partnerships with other similar collaboratives and organizations throughout the Chesapeake region. So um, yeah, we are excited to have folks join us and contact any of us at any point. Thank you. Yeah, and I just thought it was important to mention this uh, because the, um, as you know, as you can see, there's so many facets to consider. And so the nice thing about the group um, at the Million Acre Challenge, it has composting experts and people who have networks with composting experts on staff, um, it, you know, people who have uh, soil health degrees, you know, it's uh, think of it like a mycelium, like tapping into lots of other organizations that have uh, information to share. And so, um, you know, just know that you have groups that you can turn to if you have questions or want help thinking through some of these things like Brian was bringing up today of, you know, this trade-off between biomass and organic matter versus making your nutrients available. So uh, there's there's a, a great group of, of people to, uh, to reach out to. Um, and, and so I think that since uh, uh, Lisa did get dropped there, um, this, I, I think we've reached the uh, end of our time. So we'll be able to end a little early. And if um, there are some lingering questions, we do still have time. So feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask any, anything else that might pop up. Um, but we, we definitely thought this was a great time of year to run a session like this, as um, Brian and Hannah were saying, you know, this is the time to think through your plans for the spring. Um, so you have, have time on your side and you're not rushing last minute. Um, we, this is a good time to think through your food safety considerations. And if your, you know, your farm is set up in a way where you might need to ship something so there's not cross contamination happening. Uh, so, so, you know, enjoy your, 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 your well-earned winter time um, and feel free to reach out to any of our great uh, panel of experts. Um, uh, this winter. And thank and you. And Dave, uh, this is Brenda. I'd just like to make just a comment and suggestion since the focus is on composting today mm -hmm. is in the survey, which everybody should take on question four, use this space for other, you know, comments and suggestions. If you are interested in composting workshops or training or learning more how to do it yourself, 
we would we're thinking about how to provide that technical assistance next year so please write anything in there that you might see moving forward on this topic excellent thank you for that brenda um, well, so it was really great to see everybody today. Um, uh, do take time to fill out that survey um, while things are still fresh in your minds. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for joining and sharing your knowledge. Um, incredibly appreciated. And uh, look for me, look for a follow up email from me with the slides and recording and any documents that were, were shared. All right, have a good rest of the day. Thanks, Nave. Thank you.